This is She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. Your host, Kinsey Roberts, interviews incredible women in the wedding industry who are making their mark and creating success on their terms. Join the conversation. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 113 of She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. This is your host, Kinsey Roberts, and I'm flying solo today to share with you four things I think you should have in your contract. Before I get to those four things, plus two bonus tips, I wanted to remind you that if you are a current or aspiring venue owner, I would love to have you join me in the Venue Academy, which is brought to you by my friend Lindsay Lucas of Lean On Me Consulting. Consultants. Lindsay is actually hosting a Q&R, Q&A webinar next Tuesday, October 9th, for anyone interested in enrolling in the Venue Academy. And I'm also going to do my own episode on the Venue Academy so that you can decide if it might be for you or not. I've chatted about it a little bit on the podcast, but if you're just tuning in, I really don't even want to call it a course because it truly is a step-by-step guide. I've seen the entire course myself. It's a step-by-step guide from starting a venue to your very first opening day. Now, one thing I do want to mention is you heard me say current venue owner. So you're, if you, you might be thinking, if I already own a venue, why would this course be good for me? And here's why I think it would be great for you. If you are looking at expanding, if you are looking at booking more clients, if you want to make sure you're doing the right things, if you need a business plan to take to a bank or investors to get a loan for your expansion, I still think the Venue Academy Academy could be great for you for that reason and because Lindsay has done something really great with the Academy she's creating a membership community and I don't know any other place where venue owners can get in community talk to each other I know there's a couple of Facebook groups but I think this is going to be one of those communities where we can really share what's going on and not just kind of those surface level conversations and I'm really looking forward to it so join me back here Thursday October on uh, in a couple of days well, if you're listening to this in real time, it's uh, October 2nd as I record this. So that'll be Thursday, October 4th. Join me back here. And that's where I'm going to dive deep into the actual course, everything that it includes and share the bonuses that I will be offering for those of you who purchase the Venue Academy through my link. It is an affiliate link. I will be compensated if you purchase the Venue Academy through my link. I want to be very upfront about that. So don't hesitate to let me know if you have any questions. The best place to reach me is on Instagram. I'm at she creates business. If you have questions about this course or anything, really, let me know. Get on there and ask me any and all questions that you have. I'm an open book. Okay, without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. These are four things that I think we should all have in our contracts. Some of them, one of them is for venue owners specifically, but and one of them is for planners specifically, but I think as wedding vendors, we can all take a deeper look into our contract and we should be reading our contracts at once every quarter or at least twice a year, you know, before the season and after the season to see if we need to add anything. I'll tell you what, I sometimes add stuff into our contract, even right after a wedding on a Sunday, if something has happened and I'm like, oh, I really need to put that in our contract. I'll just go in and add it so that anyone who books going forward now has the newest version of our contract. I'm not afraid to play with my contract. I will caveat this with the with telling you that I'm not a lawyer. I don't write contracts. Please don't take this as legal advice. Don't take this as legal advice. I don't know what else to say. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just telling you what my experience is. And I will tell you that the majority of my contract was professionally written. And I've added things in as I've had experiences at the venue. And I feel comfortable doing that because I do a lot of research. And I know that I've added things appropriately. I also have it reviewed by an attorney after I add things. So want to make that perfectly clear. This is not legal advice. This is just tips from your friendly neighborhood podcaster. (laughs) So let's dive right in. Number one is I wonder if you have a communication clause in your contract. And if you don't, I really encourage you to add one into your contract. This is something that I learned from Heidi, who runs Ira and Lucy. She was a speaker at a Rocky Mountain Bride magazine event that I went to back in April of 2018 in Denver, Colorado. And she was a complete powerhouse. That's honestly probably one of the best uh, talk talks I've ever heard. It was actually informative. There was like literally actions we could leave that talk and go implement in our business. And you know how I feel about that if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time. So anyway, 
off of that. That was a side note. But I learned this from Heidi in her talk. And she added, it's something that she added after she had a problem, of course, right? Because we look back and say, shoot, now I've had a problem. Now I'm going to add it. But it, it, something happened to her with communication. And that's why she added it into her contract. And I thought it was so brilliant. I added it into our contract. And so what is a communication clause? What does that include? And here's what it includes. Number one are your business hours. Make business hours for your business. Don't make people think you're available 24 seven because you are not. And setting up business hours sets an expectation and boundaries for yourself and for your clients. And boundaries equal responsibility because people are going to look at your contract and they're going to read it and say, oh, Kinsey's only available from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So as a normal human being, if I email her at 10 p.m., I know she's not going to get back to me until tomorrow. I'm not saying that everyone will feel that way, but at least you have something to refer back to, right? That's the point of a contract is to create boundaries and to create a reference point that is in black and white that two people have signed, correct? Correct. So add your business hours into your communication clause, into your contract, whatever those might be for you. When will you respond to your clients or to inquiries? Now, your or I'm sorry, not inquiries. Your contract is for your clients. So when will you respond? Do you need a 24-hour buffer to respond to clients, especially if their wedding isn't for 12 months? I think you do. So go ahead and put that into your contract. Tell them, I will respond to your inquiry within 24 hours. And whether that be a telephone message, whether that be an email, let them know when you'll get back to them. Again, it gives them a piece peace of mind because they know when you're going to get back to them, but it also holds you accountable because you know that in your contract, it says you'll get back to people in 24 hours. So get in your inbox sister and answer your emails, right? The other thing that is helpful with is that, like I say, if someone is emailing you at midnight and they're freaking out and you don't get back to them until nine o'clock in the morning, you don't have to feel bad because you can say, hi, thanks so much for emailing me, Sally. I, you know, as I mentioned, I don't, re I respond to emails in 24 hours and during my business hours. Looks like you emailed me at 12.03 a.m. And while I totally appreciate that because I know that's when your planning period happens, I'm not checking email at that time. Here's, you know, section three of your contract just to remind you of what my business hours are and my communication clause if someone is freaking out about the time it takes you to get back to them, right? It's so helpful to have those things as a reference point. So find out what, figure out what your business hours are, put them in there and figure out an, a time frame you can accurately and effectively and efficiently respond to your clients and stick that in there, whether it be 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. If their current clients and their wedding is not for 12 months, one day is perfectly fine. Now, some of you are cringing and you're saying, oh my gosh, I really, what if my wedding is tomorrow or what if it's a week from now? Great. Put that in there. Say if your wedding, you know, once your wedding is 14 days out, once your wedding is 30 days out, I'll respond to you within six hours. Once your wedding is 48 hours away, I'll respond to you within an hour. Whatever feels comfortable for you, do it. Trust me, you cannot over explain in your contract because People, what happens is this, when something isn't laid out clearly, it's very ambiguous and there's a gray area. But if you have something black and white to reference to, then that really depletes confusion. And when people are confused, it breeds animosity because they don't understand. So if they don't understand what your business hours are, if they don't understand when you're going to get back to them, if they don't understand um, when you are actually going to, if you don't, they don't understand that you will get back to them. If if their wedding is, you know, only a week away in a way shorter period of time, then they are confused and they don't under, they don't get it. So they're going to, it creates animosity and it creates resentment. So totally nix that in the bud and just put your hours in there of when you're going to reply to people. And like I say, if you need to it add an additional rem uh, response time for folks whose weddings are really close, do that. Ours is close. I say in our contract for the venue, I tell people we'll respond to them within 24 hours. And then once their wedding is two weeks out, I tell them we'll respond to them within two hours. There is nothing that's going to blow up in two hours. I know that for sure because I'm prepared otherwise. <laughs> so unless like the building burns down, there's nothing that needs response within 30 seconds. I know that for sure. And if there is, I have my email on my phone a lot of the times and I'm checking it throughout the day. So 
uh, I can make that decision in the interim or in that moment if someone is completely having a cow. But I don't need to do that because I know my contract has stated when I'll get back to people. It makes me feel comfortable that way. So I hope that makes sense. And I, I really want to drive that home because we are human beings and I, and I don't think we need to be available 24-7 for people. I just don't feel that way. Okay. Another part of your communication clause can be the answer to whether or not clients can contact you via social media. For VistaView events, the venue that I own, the answer is no. And I have that specifically in our contract that you can contact us via social media if you see a picture that we post and you want to know if you can use that arbor. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and just respond a quick yes or no, that's ours, or nope, the bride ran to that specifically. But don't try to contact me on Facebook. Don't DM me on Instagram. Questions about your contract, trying to schedule your rehearsal or your final walkthrough. No, no, no. I don't deal with that. And I like to file communication appropriately. So I always tell people in the contract, it says, don't talk to me specifically about your wedding on any social media channel. You must email me at this email address so I can save and file this communication. So if you or I ever need to refer back to it, it has been filed appropriately. So our couples know that. And now if you like to talk to your couples on Instagram, on Facebook, on Snapchat, that's great. And I applaud you for that. But I will caution you and tell you that you don't own those social media platforms. Your account could get hacked. Your account could go down. Those social media platforms could disappear. And what if you have really important communication that has happened within that social media platform? Poof, it's gone. And you can't get it back. And what if you need to reference it because now you and this you know, client are in some sort of contractual battle and you don't have the information that you need. So I really encourage you to have some kind of social media clause that says, feel free to, you know, banter on social media. Of course, say it more professionally than this, but don't ask me specific questions about your wedding. It's so hard to keep track of things. So similarly, in the same vein, do you let clients text message you and when and how often? So if you are letting clients text you, I applaud you. But Again, this is where your business hours could come in so that they're not expecting a text message back from you right away. So when people text you, they expect you to respond right away. And that's the nature of text messaging. That's why people do it. Sometimes people will text us and they'll say, oh, I'm running late for my tour. I don't ever respond to them because I don't let people text us. It is my cell phone, but I don't want to talk to people via text. And that's also in our contract. Don't text me. I actually have a really logistical reason for not letting people text. As you know, I live on a ranch and I truly don't always have service on my cell phone and I can't always get text messages. But not only that, very logistical reason, but I don't want to text my couples. I reserve texting for my personal life and I'm not interested in doing that for my couples. There's nothing that we need to text about even on the day of your wedding. So email me. I have it with me all the time. Call me on the phone period. And the other thing is, is it really creates that boundary. I'm, I'm a human with a personal life. I'm not just here to run your venue as your wedding vendor. I am a person and I don't want you to have my cell phone number to text me. If you guys are really comfortable and close with your clients and you love for them to text you, that's great. The only thing that I want to encourage you is to make sure you're saving those text messages somehow, again, so that you are able to refer back to that information should you need to do that for any reason at all. If there's a scheduling conflict, if people are confused about the schedule, whatever it is, make sure you're somehow documenting those text messages so that you can refer back to them if you need to. And then finally, um, your contact information. Sometimes I don't see this in contracts that I've read over for venues specifically. In your communication clause, put your contact information in there. It's right on the, my communication clause is right on page number one. And it says, this is our email address. This is our address. This is our phone number. And the reason I found that really helpful is that uh, at first we were getting a lot of questions like, oh, I'm doing my invitations or my wedding website. What's your address? Well, now I popped it in on the first page of our contract and it pretty much eliminated those questions <laughs> because it's right there on the front page and they remember it because it's the first page that they read. So make sure you actually have your communication information within your contract. That's number one, communication clause. That's a lot, right? Okay. Number two, this is specifically for wedding planners and I'm not a wedding planner. You know that, 
But I was having a really great conversation with a local wedding planner and we were talking about her business and how she's growing and how she has decided to, you know, raise her prices for 2019 for full planning clients and day of clients and just a, just a really great business chat. But one of the things that stood out to me was that this planner has been in business for years and years and years and she's amazing and we love her at the venue and she has it really down to a science. She knows how many hours it takes her to do a full planning client, which I think is really impressive. The issue is that she's still letting clients have 100% of her time anytime they want it for full planning clients. And even in some cases, her day of clients because she kind of does month of management. So she's really letting, giving them full access to her schedule because I don't know why exactly, but I asked her, like, do you want that? Is that something that makes you feel like your full planning clients are getting value from you? And she's like, actually, no, I really don't want that, but I don't know how to get out of it. And here's my recommendation to anybody who's doing that, who feels the same way, and that is to create actual hours and in-person boundaries for your full planning clients and put them into your contract. So Somebody doesn't need unfettered access to your calendar to get value from you as a full planner. I don't believe that at all. And again, I'm not a planner, so if you're kind of laughing at me, I'm sorry, but I don't think it is. You're 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 a person. Nobody needs full access to your calendar except for your family, period. Um, and I don't think that, here's the thing, people don't know what they don't know. So if you have a full planning client and you're booking, you know, you book new clients for 2019 and you create actual hours that they get you in person, they don't know any better. They're not thinking, oh my gosh, why don't I have 24 seven access to you? That's crazy. No, they're thinking, oh, okay, great. I get three up to three hour meetings with you for planning and design. That's wonderful. It creates boundaries. And more than that, friends, it creates responsibility on the part of the client. They need to be responsible enough to schedule those meetings for you. And there's a boundary in place, knowing that they need to be organized when they do meet with you because they get up to three hours. They don't get to chill with you at Starbucks for eight hours talking about the color of their napkins right? They need to be organized. They need to be ready for that meeting. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So instead of giving people that 24 seven access to you, like, sure, I'll meet you any day of the week, anytime at any location, let them know we can have three. This is just an example. And it's in your contract. You get three up to three hour meetings with me for your, for my full planning clients. And then, you know, unlimited email access, but your business hours are still in there. So it's not like you're trying to respond to emails at one o'clock in the morning, right? Something like that to give you peace of mind and to have, again, a boundary to point to when they start crossing the line because some people will, right? Most people won't, but that's not who our contracts are for. Our contracts are for those folks who who need them, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, another thing is to put in there, if you have that your clients can text you or what have you, make sure you really do have that communication clause in there because I don't want people, again, if you allow clients to text you, to DM you on Instagram or whatever, they're expecting you to respond to them right away. That's why people do that. And so I really need you to decide, are you going to respond to text messages at one o'clock in the morning if the wedding isn't tomorrow? You know what I mean? I don't think that's necessary. Please protect your time. Learn how to protect your time because it's the only thing we have. It's the it's the one thing we cannot get back. So protect your time and it will, again, breed responsibility in your client because they know, ooh, Kinsey is not answering text messages at one o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to email this and I know she's going to get back to me right away in the morning, right? So learn how to protect your time. Put those clauses in there. Don't give people unfettered access to your calendar, even if they're full planning clients. I don't think that's necessary. Okay, number three is this is optional. And this is maybe part of your onboarding. This may not be in your contract, although I do recommend it. But maybe this is part of your onboarding email. Or maybe even it's part of your reminder emails. And actually, I recommend both. Let me tell you what it is. Include what the package is not. So if a client, this could be for photographers, if you are a venue and you offer multiple packages, if you're a planner and this is day of versus full planning or what have you, in part of, as part of your contract in, or part of your onboarding, include what the package they've purchased from you isn't. So that way there is in black and white, they have again, a reference point to say, oh, 
I'm a day of client. So full planning and design isn't included. And that means I can't call Kinsey to say, hey, could you go tour these five venues for me? Or hey, which, you know, which linen do you like better? Can you go to La Tavola and touch the linen for me? Uh, No, ma'am, I cannot because you're a day of client. See you in six months. You know what I mean? So just include what they actually don't get. And then furthermore, if you are, if you have a package where you are willing or able to add things on, so if you have like an a la carte page, you can add that into their contract and say, if you decide that you want me to perform these activities, here's my a la carte pricing page. So if you decide you want me to tour venues for you, but you're still a day of client, I charge $500, I charge $750 or whatever it is. And I'll tour three venues for $750, $1,500. I don't know what your pricing is. So again, it's just creating that expectation. And are they going to read every single thing you give them? No, they're not. Even if you sit down and go line by line with people, they're still not going to remember everything. But it's not really about what they remember in the moment. They're just humans. It's really about being able to say, hey, we went over this. Here's a reminder of where you can find that information. Let me know if you want to add that a la carte piece to your day of package uh, or something of that nature, right? And then they're like, oh, that's right. This isn't included. Oh, I'd actually just have, can I just do full planning and design? Or can I just get your highest photography package? Because I realize I want like four of these a la carte options. So let's just bump it up right? So that's something that you can include in your contract or in your onboarding messages is what you purchased from us and what it doesn't include. Now, I know that sounds kind of negative, but if you frame it in a way of, it's sort of like a proposal, if you frame it in the sense of this is what you can add if you'd like to down the road, let me know. Now be careful and make sure you give it a timeline. So don't, you know, call me two weeks before your wedding and try to make me your full planning wedding planner and try to make me plan your wedding in 14 days, right? No, 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 that's not happening. So make sure you give them a timeline. Like here's everything you can add within XYZ amount of time. So frame it that way. Like look at all these great additions that you could add for if you wanted to, you know, at least six months before your wedding or whatever it is, instead of this is everything we don't include. You know what I mean? (laughs) Um, So it's really all just about positioning. Now, finally, this is for my venue owners. And these are some specific experiences that I have had. And what uh, specifically in your contract, what alcohol policies do you have? And what isn't allowed at your venue when it comes to those really serious things like alcohol. Some of the venues listening, you might have, you might just work with one bartending company. That's it. That's who they get. Or you personally have a liquor license. And so you supply all of the alcohol. Great. Some of us don't. I, we work with some recommended vendors and we personally have but in a, but we do work with those vendors, but we personally have rules at our venue that are important to us that are outlined in our contract. So let me share two of those with you. The first is that we don't serve any shots past eight o'clock at night. So we do allow shots, especially for like the bridal party, but past eight o'clock, nobody's drinking shots at our venue. And we've decided that for a number of reasons. Of course, you guys, I don't have to tell you, your wedding vendors. <laughs> shots don't really ever lead to good decisions, but it's something that we've decided to do. So that's something that's in our contract. So our couples are not surprised when the bartender is like 805 and they're saying, oh, no, sister, no more vodka shots for you. Uh, And the other thing along with, with alcohol is that we don't allow alcohol delivery any time after the ceremony. So you need to plan accordingly and make sure you order enough alcohol for your wedding. There is no delivery of alcohol halfway through the wedding. Uh Uh-oh, we're going to run out. We still have an hour. Nope. Sorry. Then you're just out of alcohol when you're out of alcohol. Again, and I, and I, I say this because it doesn't make me feel bad because here's what it does. It breeds responsibility and it puts the impetus on the couple to be good planners and to be responsible and to get their stuff done. Make sure you're working with an awesome alcohol vendor who can help you order the right amount, right? And I don't have people like, oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, we could just bring extra if we need to. Nope, you actually can't. It says it right here. So again, I like to add things into the contract, not to make people feel like, ew, we can't do anything at this venue or, oh my gosh, this planner won't do anything with us. No, no, no. We frame it in a really positive way. And what happens is it breeds responsibility into our couples. So that's really the point of our contract is to help outline those boundaries and guidelines to help people feel empowered to be responsible and make good planning decisions, right? 
Okay. So that was my four tips. So let me just quickly go over them again. Number one is have a communication clause in your contract. Number two was for planners. And that was put some actual hours and boundaries in your contract for your full planning clients and stop giving people unfettered access to your hours of life. You only get one life and time is something you cannot get back. Number three is to put what your package doesn't include in your contract in a way that says, here's what you can add and not just a negative, yuck, here's what we don't do for you. It's more like a, here's the additions that you can add, like a proposal. And number four was for my venue friends or anyone, but put in specific policies and rules in your contract that you could share with another vendor but that your couple may not know that they do need to know. So for us specifically, that's no shots after eight o'clock at night and no alcohol delivery anytime after your ceremony has started. So those are for my venues. But if you're, you know, other wedding vendors, I'm sure you can think of, oh, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll add in there that, oh, I don't handle the money of your gift table cards. You know what I'm saying? Like things that you don't do. Okay, so I also said in addition to the four things you might want to add to your contract that I had two additional tips for you when it came to reminding your clients um, about rules and policies and things of that nature. And the first is to create workflows in HoneyBook or in Dubsado, if those are the systems that you're using, that automatically send reminders or send emails to your clients that gives them additional information or shares once again what is in their contract and what was on their onboarding package or on their onboarding email. But it's just like another, hey, remember this tip? Like, here's five things you could do today to help make your wedding more successful or whatever it is. So I'll give you two examples of workflows I have set up in Dubsado. And the first workflow is uh, 65 days out from the wedding, which is about 30 days. It's just over 30 days before I need their special event insurance certificate. I send an automated email and this is in Dubsado. It's just, you know, 65 days before the wedding date, send this email. And the email says, Hey, remember that I need your special event insurance on this date, which is automated through Dubsado. I put in a field and it automatically populates their, the correct date. I need your special event insurance certificate. Here's where you can upload that in your client portal. And it's a nice big button at the bottom of the email. And that's automated. I set all of that up when I'm onboarding a client. I just click, 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 and everything is set to go. Now, is the date in their contract of when I need special event insurance? Of course it is. But you were a venue. We are booked with clients 12 months out, sometimes 14 months out. I don't expect them, would I love it? Yes, I would, but we're all humans. I don't expect them to be reading through their contract every 30 days to make sure they have stuff. No, no, no. It's my responsibility as the vendor to make sure that I'm leading them in the right direction. And again, providing that support and that great client experience that doesn't lead to confusion or resentment and animosity. So I send lots of reminders and helpful tips via automated workflows. So that reminder to to give me their special event insurance is one of them. The next reminder that I have that automatically goes out is a reminder to schedule their final walkthrough with their wedding planner and their ceremony rehearsal with their wedding planner and their officiant and whoever they feel like needs to be at the rehearsal. So those are all automated. We use Dubsado. I know you can create automations like that in HoneyBook as well. If you're using something aside from HoneyBook and Dubsado, I can't speak directly to those. I'm assuming they have some sort of automated feature. But that's a tip. So take out important parts of your contracts and your documentation that you give to couples and stick them into HoneyBook and Dubsado and make them automated to create reminders. I sometimes see wedding vendors think that, oh, you have a contract. You have everything you need. You don't need to contact me for this information anymore. And that's actually not a great client experience. And it sort of reminds me about, and it reminds me of marketing. And they say in marketing that a person, a potential client or a prospect needs seven brand touches before they'll remember you. And I feel like it's similar with our couples. They need multiple reminders and multiple ways to get information before they remember. So do that for them. Those automations and workflows are super easy to set up in Dipsado and HoneyBook. And if you need help, let me know. And so finally, number six is make your contract, this is a tip, uh, well, it's not number six, it's five and six, I guess, but these two extra tips. So that, but that was make automated workflows. That was my tip number one, to remind people about important things in your contract. And then my second tip is make your contract and your documentation 
easy to read. Make it pleasing to the eye. Make it easy for the eye to flow through. Add headings to your contract. Add some bullet points. Add bolded letters. Add italics where you need to because it helps the eye flow through the document easier. I feel like sometimes we think that in order for something to be professional, like don't put smiley faces in there or anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not telling you to like fill your contract with emojis, but I'm telling you to make it easier for the client to read, to their eye to be drawn to the next heading or the next next number, the next section of the contract, make, put some bullet points in there. If it's a listicle, make it some bullet points. I'll give you an example. There's certain specifications that we require for special event insurance at the venue. Uh, the event, it has to be a $300,000 policy. It has to have a host liquor liability and one other thing. And so I made those bullet points so that they see, okay, here's the section that talks about special event insurance. And then here's the requirements that my specific special event insurance has to have. And it makes it easier for them to read. Now, again, I'm not an attorney, so consult with your attorney on that. But I think that If we make things easier for people to get through and we're not just like, here is a 27 volume block of text of my contract, good luck, that it's easier for them to get through as a human, right? So write it for a human being so their eyes can easily move through it and that they hit on all of those important parts. I hope that was helpful. I know I talked a lot today, but I think that contracts are important for us. They're also important for our clients and they're they create those boundaries. Don't be afraid to add things to your contract. And most importantly, get advice from an actual attorney. I am not an attorney. This is not legal advice. I just wanted to give you some tips that you can maybe take to your personal attorney and say, hey, I'd like to add these things or do you think these are a good idea? How can I add them so they make sense for my business and my processes? Thank you so much for joining me today. If you are interested in getting on the wait list for the Venue Academy that I chatted about at the beginning of the episode, just tap your podcast player. The link is right in the show notes. You can also go to shecreatesbusinesspodcast.com and at the top of my page, there is the link that says the Venue Academy. Click on it and you'll be able to hop on the wait list. It's just to hear about the Venue Academy. I'm not gonna email you about anything else. Thank you again for listening and I will see you back here next time. Thank you so much for listening to She Creates Business. Please take a minute and head to iTunes to leave an honest review so we can help more wedding pros find the show.